Welcome back to the Defining Moments podcast. On today's episode, we continue our eight-part series on leadership through adversity with Senior Chief Tom George, CEO of Quarterback Impact Academy. Today, we learn how Senior Chief George transitioned from leading sailors to leading student athletes. In, uh, in 2014, I left Jacksonville and I came to Oklahoma. Um, when I selected the orders to come to Oklahoma, I knew that I was going to retire. Sometimes you know time's up, right? And it's time for a change. Um, I, had, I had started, I, I had already coached high school football um, with some great coaches in Florida. And Nick was going on to the Air Force Academy at the time. Brandon was a highly touted high school quarterback, freshman. I was coming to Oklahoma. <clears throat> Nick and Brandon are your sons. Yes, I'm sorry. Nick and Brandon are my sons. So Nick, Nick just, so let's, let's rewind, right? Nick, Nick graduated high school in 2014. Okay. So in May, June of 2014, Nick is on his way to the Air Force Academy. Brandon, they just got done playing. Brandon was a freshman. Nick was a senior. They just got done playing in a Florida 5A state title. And I have decided to spend, I have decided to take orders to Oklahoma City, um, which we all know there's no Navy base in Oklahoma City, right? Tinker's got a little Navy. but um, And the reason I say that is because a lot of people, a lot of close friends were like, dude, like Brandon just played in a 5A state title as a quarterback. Nick was a freshman. You coached at that high school. I like, what are you doing, right? In and Florida. In Florida, yeah. right? And I was. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I didn't parent the way parents parent today. Um, and I'm not being rude, but you don't get a vote until you earn a vote. And I make decisions for teenagers in my life. Um, my my son can say yes or no. But 15 year old young men aren't smart enough to make decisions for themselves. So those are the decisions I make. Um, I've always told my boys that if you're a good father and a good husband and you hate me, I'm going to be okay. But you're going to make an impact on society. Um, I don't need to be friend to my children. They know I love them. Um, and, and I, I do find it's odd because we live in this society where they're like, well, I'm going to ask little Johnny. And I'm like, well, he's nine. <laughs> what are you going to ask him? Like, he just got done playing with his trucks. <laughs> it's never made sense to me. Uh, but uh, we, it, was, it was my decision to pull Brandon off that football team and come to Oklahoma. Um, there, was, there was a job in Oklahoma that was... Uh, I was intrigued about it and it was it was something I I wanted to do. Um, so the job in Oklahoma, I worked for Navy Recruit Center Dallas DFW, but I was in Oklahoma and I was the spec op scout uh, director of special operations uh, um, recruiting and training. And so I did that in Oklahoma City. Well, while I did that, Brandon was a Brandon was a sophomore at Jones High School. Okay. So understand, I just took orders to Oklahoma. He's a sophomore at Jones High School. And I get a call from the Wing 11 Master Chief. And she says, hey, before you go to Oklahoma, now I'm a, I've already packed. Brandon's already in Oklahoma. He came early to play summer football, right? So I think I'm coming to Oklahoma. She goes, I need you to go um, to the Middle East for a year. So right now, my Nick just went to the Air Force Academy. Brandon's living in Oklahoma with friends at a school he knows nobody at, right? Um, but the head coach and the families there are taking care of him. And they asked me to go with a squadron to the Middle East because there's a 
ginormous culture issue in this squadron and they have failed at tactical tests and personality tests and all these tests and they wanted to essentially they wanted me to just insert myself into that squadron so of course i say yes right so i'm not one i'm a solutions guy um, our society is a busy society. Well, busy is really what your priorities are. The term busy means you're not important to me, so you don't count today. That's what busy is. Nobody's really that busy in my eyes. Busy is when your oldest son goes to the Air Force Academy, your youngest son's in Oklahoma, and you got to go to Iraq. That's busy. And you're the only adult, right? So like, to me, that's busy. So I don't get, you know, this whole, oh my God. Uh, I went to Miss Panera this morning and coffee and, and I'm so busy. Like it, I, I've never understood that, but whatever. So I go to Iraq. I'm on my way to Iraq. So I check into this squadron and I insert myself pretty aggressively. I know you're shocked, but a little bit more aggressive than Tom normally does. Cause I already know it's a shit show. So I insert myself pretty aggressively. And I remember walking down the hallway and remember, I've never been a company guy, ever. Like I've never, in fact, young people in the military love me, high ranking people, I don't see eye to eye with. Cause my concern was always the mission and these young people. So I'm walking down the hallway and just checking in, sitting in the master chief's office, brand new senior chief, senior chief Brian Anderson, right? So we're both senior chiefs, right? So. You know, I'm going to stick my chest out a little bit, right? So I remember uh, uh, Master Chief Terry Zeneker calling in, me into the office and saying, hey, I want you to meet Senior Chief Brian Anderson, right? And I remember, uh, you know, of course, shaking his hand, dapping him up. And, uh, and like a week later, he knows another Senior Chief named Bobby Falls. And he introduces me to Bobby Falls. And uh, these are two new Senior Chiefs that came in. So they bring in three new senior chiefs, right? The squadron's got issues. The unique thing is Bobby runs quality assurance, which is basically HR slash OSHA for the Navy squadron. Brian runs production to make sure we have the tools we need and the airplanes we need to do the mission. I run tactical operations. I make sure we have the tactical data to do the operation, right? In any squadron in the world, those three guys dislike each other because they're not even close, right? They're always, I need, I need the airplane for my mission. I need my operators, blah, blah, blah. They're always bickering, right? What weirdly worked out is we became these three senior chiefs that had this unique, aggressive partnership. <clears throat> but the higher ups didn't see this coming. So we became these group of three senior chiefs and we called ourselves the Shady Eights, okay? Because being a senior chief's an E8, right? So we called ourselves the Shady Eights. And we told the world that we were, uh, we made a patch, um, I think, yeah, we yeah. made a patch <laughs> and the patch says 99.91%. So we told the world that we are always right 99.91% <laughs> of the times, right? So we created this patch and then actually, try, and then the baby blowing the chewing gum is, is the military treated us like babies. So we would just sit there and, and blow our chewing gum. Right. So we became this kind of group of I, not misfits because we all were powerful in our own own era of being senior chiefs, but we worked together and, but we all had one common goal and that was our sailors. Like honestly through the fun and bickering and the stuff we did in the middle East, which was absolutely ridiculous. We, we all had one common goal and that's how are, how are our sailors doing? How are the people doing in the squadron? Can we complete the mission and still not overwork our employee? You know, like that was our, our ultimate goal. <clears throat> Although we did things along the way that we shouldn't have done in the Middle East. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you one story. So I remember one quick afternoon and the intel department comes out and says hey you can't go off base 
We're at Issa Air Base outside of Bahrain. You can't go off base, right? So I call Bobby and Brian. I'm like, hey, let's go off base. And they're like, bro, they just said we can't go off base. And I'm like, bro, we should go off base. So of course they're like, all right, right? So I remember, I remember we leave the base and we get caught up in a traffic jam because there's literally protests and like terrorists and they're like, we hate America, right? And Bobby never sat in the driver's seat or the passenger seat. He sat in the back corner of the van because Bobby's philosophy was the sniper's <laughs> going to pick off the driver and the guy in the passenger seat first. I'm sitting in the back. Well, of course, Tom always sat in the driver's seat or the passenger seat, right? And then Brian would kind of hover. So, um, but I remember coming around a corner and where traffic lined up and people, Middle Eastern people, and which this isn't a Middle Eastern people issue. It's just at the time it was bad, are looking in the van like, okay. And to our left are burning tires. <laughs> so... Of course, the, 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 the stuff that's going through the van is like, all right, what, what do we do? So Brian pulls up Google, and in Issa, Bahrain, there's like a, um, like a Hilton hotel, like a mile away, that's got a bar at it. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't say this, but so we go to the Hilton hotel, and, and we tuck ourselves away and we order a drink and we're like, look, if we're going to go, we're going to all this, in. This, we're all in. <laughs> this is how we're going. Needless to say, as the night went down, things calmed down and we got back to the base. But the moral of the story was we were indestructible together. Um, and we really thought that together, leading together, and being able to work with others to control the culture of the command like coaches would, we felt like we were indestructible because we felt like we were doing the right thing for these young people. Now, of course, together we made dumb decisions because we enjoyed each other and we enjoyed like to have fun. But at the end of the day, there wasn't an ego. We never tried to outdo each other, even though the three of us were senior chiefs. We really just wanted to do what's best for the squadron because we knew that those young people were in a squadron that failed. And when young people are in a squadron that fails, they, it, it always goes down to them, right? So their life sucks because the squadron failed. So, so fast forward, the Shady Eights, um, Brian and Bobby Falls, my brother's best friends to this day. And, uh, and, and, and someday, uh, when the three of us are old enough, uh, and 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 we kick the bucket, um, wherever we end up, uh, we'll, we'll be we'll be causing hate and discontent, uh, you know, in heaven. But uh, <clears throat> so I get back, so I volunteer to go to go to go to Iraq, um, um, and and while I was there, right in the middle of it was when things got crazy with ISIS in Syria. Mm. So we. Uh, there, there's never been Navy contingent in Syria. So the last three months of that deployment, which was a seven month deployment, we built this tactical operational center in Syria. So it was, it was one of the greatest ways for me to, to end my career because I, I wanted to be in the mix and I was in the mix. I always wanted to be in the mix, man. I, like I needed it. It was, it was kind of my... Uh, it was it was kind of my my recovery. It was what I needed. Uh, <clears throat> I almost uh, I ask myself to this day if if I picked the mission over my family. Um, I'm blessed because my my sons Nick and Brandon have they lived a life in a way that ha they had every reason to push back in me and be undisciplined young men that would hate their dad because they never got the attention, but they understood. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying the mission should have been my priority, but I'm saying 
I failed at so many levels and they understood. Like I miss birthdays, I miss holidays, and they never, not one time in my 25 year career did they push back at me, not one time. Um, and I think it's a testament to who they are and their understanding of what's bigger and, and, and their understanding of humanity and what needs to be done. I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I was right, but because my, my boys understood service and honor, they, they understood why I had to go. Um, so I get back from Iraq in February. Remember, I left in May time frame. And uh, I finally get out here to Oklahoma. So Brandon plays his sophomore year. Um, I'm on deployment in Iraq. So I get back to Oklahoma and I have two more years in Oklahoma. And in um, October, uh, I, I retire in August of 2016. Um, my official date was October, but I, I, so I retire in August of 2016. For the next two years uh, during that time frame, um, I served in Oklahoma and uh, I coached high school football at Jones, Oklahoma. I was blessed to be around great coaches and great players and we won a, a 3A state championship here in Oklahoma. Um, Brandon, my uh, youngest son, played quarterback and he was the, the Oklahoma player of the year. And my oldest son, Nick, was a three-year starter at UCO. Um, so um, I, 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 I was able to kind of grow my roots here in Oklahoma. Um, kind of during that time frame, I started training quarterbacks more. Um, and as an assistant, I started training quarterbacks with DeBartolo Sports, which was a DeBartolo, uh, Eddie DeBartolo used to own the San Francisco 49ers. And it was kind of a byproduct of Nike. So Nike provided um, assets for DeBartolo Sports. So it was under Nike. So I was kind of an assistant coach for them. Um, the head football quarterback coach was Joe Dickinson. He was a consultant with the Buffalo Bills. He's a former offensive coordinator for the Oklahoma Sooners wow. under Switzer in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, older guy. Um, he's probably taught me. We actually, I left on not great terms. But I'll tell you to this day, and I'll tell him to this day, um, he... It, probably 80% of my quarterbacking understanding and acumen of the game came from Joe Dickinson. He was a fantastic coach. Um, but why I left was I've always felt like I've always felt that coaches um, at every level don't understand leadership and don't understand the platform they hold. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that way today. Um, I'll be honest with you. There's some NFL games I watch and I'm like, geez, like I wouldn't follow that guy anywhere. How in the world is it? Same, same with college. I've never understood why. I understand the, the football side of it, but I've always believed that the CEO of a football team can be a great leader and not a great football guy. And if he's smart, he's going to hire great football guys. And I think those make the best head coaches. Um, you know, so I, I was very challenged with being a part of a company that in my eyes now, I don't think they use their platform to make young men better. I thought they used, they did a great job at using their platform to make young men better football players, mm -hmm. but that was always down the list for me. M my goal was, I, I want to start with the basics. Like, how about... Thank you and you're welcome. How about when you walk out of the grocery store, your mom doesn't have five bags in her hands and you're on your phone? How about you open the door for your mom if she's got five bags in her hands or just open the door to be nice? How about you clean your room? How about you do good in school? How about you actually tell the janitor thank you for cleaning the bathroom that you chose to make a mess in? I've always thought that there was a place for that. Mm -hmm. And I needed the platform to, to talk about that. So I left the Bardlo <clears throat> and it wasn't, I mean, it, it was, it wasn't volatile, but it, we disagreed when I left, but I left. Um, and I was very honest 
with all the, the kids I trained. I contacted their families and said, I'm leaving to Bardlow. I'm not asking you to leave with me because that wouldn't be right. And I would say 98% of the kids I trained left with me. Um, and what I realized at that time is that the brand had nothing to do with the person who represents the brand. And it's funny because I learned that in the military, but it didn't stick until I built QB Impact. And what I mean is I used to tell my men and women that I led that when you're in a military uniform, you represent the brand. And the brand is you're a service member of the United States of America. And if you act like a buffoon, that's a reflection of your country. So don't wear the uniform if you're going to act that way. And I was always a big proponent of wearing the uniform. As you know, I wear it today. And I'll never be a retired guy that can't wear it. Um, I wear it because I don't deserve to wear it, to be honest with you. And I've never understood why people in the military take advantage of not wearing it. Because if you look at the history of our country, man, a lot of people gave their lives for it. So for me to wear the uniform, it's always been a badge of humility. Um, I, I used to, and I still do it, not as, I used to lay, my, when I put on my dress uniform, I used to, I would lay it in the bed and it was a process of putting my medals on and stuff. And it, it was always kind of a surreal, um, I know it's a weird term, but kind of like a dance for me because it was, it just brought back this medal and why. And, um, and the reason I bring that up is because that's what QB Impact is for me. Um, it's actually my, my PTSD recovery. Um, without QB Impact, I, I have no idea um, how I would have moved forward because it allowed me to build a program to invest everything I have in young people and families. And, and I'm still able to look at Melanie and Jason Berlowitz and, and say, um, and as I talk about their son Blaze, I can look at them and say, I'm going to bring him home. Like he's good. Um, and, and bring him home to me today is like, he's in good hands with me. I'm, I'm going to love them, but I'm going to coach them hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what kids need today. Um, they need to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, sir, and no, ma'am. And it doesn't mean they're weak by saying that. And people that believe that are idiots. I don't get it. Discipline and structure is good. Um, it's a part of understanding leadership. We are not the same, young man. I've done more than you. Like, well. You know, that's, that's an understanding of life that young people don't understand. And I wish they would, but they do at QB Impact. Um, <clears throat> um, so, so QB Impact, when I built QB Impact, that's why I, that's why I built it. People think I built it because I had this football ego and wanted to coach quarterbacks and no, nah, has nothing to do with it. Um, but I do want to touch on a topic, if it's okay with you, um, and that's recovery. Um, because QB Impact was a form of recovery for me. And in the past couple months, I've had the honor to speak to uh, BRC Recovery in Austin and, and speak to other recovery centers and people in that community that are dealing with and that are, are, are handling men and women from the military that are going through PTSD. Um, and really what I want everybody to know is that I don't have a PhD in, in being a therapist or psychiatry or whatever it is. I'm probably butchering that, but, um, <clears throat> but what I do have a PhD in is understanding service honor and pain through service. And for everybody listening that is a psychiatrist or a doctor or a therapist, 
what I would tell you is military members don't want to forget the pain because it makes them who they are every single day of the week. So if you want to help mental health, help them control it, but not remove it. Because if you remove it, you're removing who they've internalized their entire life. And every nightmare and every memory and everything that I sleep with inside this, this head of mine is what makes me wake up and it, it's what makes me motivate myself to function every day to make another human being better. And without it, it I'm not who I am. So my challenge to that mental health community is um, stop talking about rainbows and unicorns and start talking about real life trauma and um, let's figure out ways to control instead of remove. Um, and I didn't mean to get on a soapbox, but it's important to me. Mental health is a problem in today's society with young people and military members, and, and we, we got to fix it. Right. <clears throat> right. As I'm listening to your, your story and the timeline of your story, Senior Chief, is <coughs> like you, I'm very direct. I, three words that come to my mind, adversity, leadership, and service. And I'll throw in a fourth one, impact. Yeah. Let's start with adversity. What does adversity mean to you in your words and your thoughts? Um, here's, here's the thing about adversity, right? We can let adversity control us, um, or we can figure out a way to find a solution and control adversity. Um, I, I believe that I believe that I see adversity differently than most people, almost to a fault. Adversity is not going to control me. Um, I think there's two ways you can handle adversity, and there's only two. Okay, and I'm not talking about seeing a doctor and counseling and all that. I'm talking about internalizing adversity. There's two ways we can handle it. Um, you can either become a victim, lay down, just let it burn into your head at how bad it is and why me and, and you can do that. Okay. Or you can buckle up. You can realize that life is not simple, that it's actually hard. Okay. You can cry. You can, you, you can let, you need to cry and let every emotional pour through you. Okay. And then you need to get up and go to work and figure out what the solution is so that it doesn't happen again, right? That's what I do, okay? Um, and by the way, I'm not special, but why let adversity turn you into a victim? It doesn't even make sense to me. Um, because to me, one of the worst things in life is, is fear. And when adversity turns into fear, like you're going to have a lot of mental problems, right? So for me, it's always, I've always turned, adver and here's the thing, Ad adversity is tough now. I mean, you know, people lose relatives and people lose friends and it sucks, but life still has to move forward. I'm going to give you an example. I have a friend of mine who, uh, and in the military, like people have marital problems. You got to get up and do the mission the next day. You know that, right? Now there's going to be people that listen to this that are like, that's a little harsh. It's not harsh. Don't, don't raise your hand to serve if you're not willing to serve when shit's hard because that's not service, right? I'll even go here. It's, I'll, you want to talk about the Bible and Christianity? Stop asking God for help when you need him. How about you serve when he needs you? The problem is we live this life where when shit gets hard, we stop and we don't function anymore, right? So no matter what you're doing in life, it all has to stop. So you can, you can play your oh me card. And then when you're done with your oh me, then you got to get through the next phase. Then all of a sudden, hey, I'm good now. Well, during that three months, all those kids you were supposed to coach don't have a coach. 
because you were too busy feeling sorry for yourself. And I, I, I had a coach friend that did that, and I don't play that. Your responsibility is to the people that you're responsible for. When bad shit happens, figure it out, right? I'm not saying don't cry. Get on your knees, cry, pray. Use whatever platform you need to use to become better, okay? But the last thing you need to do is quit life. You got to keep moving forward. And that's everything. That's everything in life. Like we, we live in this world and we think everything is so easy. Well, life is not easy. You actually have to tie your shoes, get your boots on and go to work every day. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like figure it out. It's not hard. And I truly believe if you treat people with respect and you're willing to, to, to work your ass off, like you're going to get through adversity. The problem is nobody wants to do that. They want to feel sorry for themselves and ask the government for a, some kind of financial break. And un, unfortunately, that's the majority of our society is what about me instead of, hey, it's OK. It's tough. Let's move forward. You know what I mean? And to be honest with you, you named a lot of locations that I travel to. Nobody in this country has it bad. I will say that. I will say that on any pedestal you give me, you don't have it bad in America. You don't. I've had tea on concrete and dirt that a bomb just exploded with a family in Iraq who acted as if never happened, who were kind to me. You know why? Because although they lived in an apartment building that we just dropped a bomb on, they respected me and they weren't going to let me see their pain. But we can't do that in America. We just got to whine about it. It's got to be somebody's fault. We got to react, right? Because when we react, reaction creates a mob and we like followership, right? So people react, react to everything. Nobody thinks they react. It makes no sense that we can't be friends just because we don't have the same political agenda. It makes no sense. Okay. But that's the country we live in and it's unfortunate. Thank you for tuning into Defining Moments podcast. We hope you enjoyed episode five of Leadership Through Adversity. Next week in part six, we dive into core principles of leadership with Senior Chief George. For more Defining Moments podcast content, visit our webpage, www.undefeated.show. Follow us at Def Moments Pod on Twitter and at Defining Moments Podcast on Instagram.